homogenize the, any Cauchy material and to find the strain gradient coefficients or Coursera coefficients. So I am only able to do this in some, uh, for some special geometries that I will explain you. And uh, what I want to do is try to design the material in such a way that we have macroscopic effect of strain gradient or generalized continuum effect. So the idea is the following, you have, I am working in uh, the framework of linear elasticity and periodic media. So you have one cell and inside one cell you have some uh, different uh, stiffness of the material and for instance you want to get a Coursera material. So you think that you have some rotation inside the cell which is somehow different from the global rotation of the cell but you have a coupling between these two rotations then you have to explain another phenomenon which is how this internal rotation is coupled with the internal rotation of the next cell because in a Coursera medium you have a factor which is a gradient of the internal rotation. So how to explain this term? So you have to understand what is the mechanism which brings this information to the next cell and something has to pass through the boundary. So you have to understand this mechanism which explains how some internal variable has uh, passed the information to the next cell. And this is the same but a bit more difficult to understand for second gradient strain gradient materials. If this cell is extended in this direction, it has to inform the next cell that it is extended. How this information passed from one cell to the other one. If you think about the boundary condition, you must have something here which informs this cell that this cell has been extended in this direction. And it's not so easy to understand which mechanism can do that. So I will show you example of that and uh, I will first recall uh, the homogenization result that I have presented last year exactly at this place. So my presentation is very similar to the presentation of last year. The main difference maybe is this new logo here because we have been financed by, by, the, by the agency. But, uh, the result was this one. So I am looking about geometries of this type because I am only able to do that. So very thin, slender uh, pieces of materials with void. So here you have zero as stiffness coefficient and here very high coefficient. So you can consider that as a, as a lattice made of slender bars which are welded here. Okay, and that's the uh, simple case. If you don't like voids, you can think about very, uh, very weak material and the result will be the same. Okay, so here you have something like epsilon as a power minus five and here some epsilon as power two and that will work. Okay, and epsilon here is a ratio between the micros microscopic lengths and macroscopic lengths. And I am working in the framework of asymptotic analysis, so I let epsilon tend to zero. <coughs> so, I start with a uh, classical elastic energy, homogeneous, isotropic, and very high coefficient inside the material, minus three. And here's zero. Okay, so uh, I want to pass to the limit, homogenize such a, such a problem here and uh, I can do that in two steps. The first one uh, is study, studying the, the slender bars which, which uh, links two nodes and uh, using classical uh, asymptotic analysis of slender structures replace them by a non-local interaction between nodes, a local interaction with two terms E epsilon is the extensional terms, so they, the bars uh, play like uh, springs. And you have another term which is much weaker, you have an epsilon square here, which is due to bending and torsion if you are in 3D. So two different terms of two different order of magnitude. And you have to introduce the rotation of the nodes 
for which you have to give some sense, a mean value of the rotation of, the, of a ball here, because you have to take into account the bending of the bars between two nodes, and so you have to take into account the rotation of this, uh, of this node. So you have to introduce a new and internal variable, which is the rotation of the nodes. So you replace this energy by a discrete energy, which is an energy between nodes, and you prove that the asymptotic limit of this energy is the same than this one. So this is the first step, and then you will pass to the limit in this step. So the energy is here, some notation, APSS prime means uh, the interaction between uh, the node number S of one cell and the node number S prime of the next cell following P. P is a direction for, for, for precising which neighbor cells you are dealing with. So P, uh, in a 2D case, P can take uh, five values. You have the cell on the right, above, here and here. And the other cells here, you get them by symmetry, by periodicity. So here you have a, a matrix of interaction which describe the networks you are, you are working with. So then you pass to the limit in a rather simple way because at the, uh, at the starting point here you cannot uh, use a double scale expansion, it doesn't work, but here it works. So you, you plug a double scale expansion for U and theta here and you end up with an energy which is boy, it's not so, so intricate. You have two terms, one due to um, extensional energy, one due to bending energy, and you have a constraint here. Okay, so this is the result, and then you have to understand what is this energy, is it a strain gradient, it is something more general, and you have explicit value for this uh, uh, expression for this uh, function E bar and F bar, which are here, which are more or less the, the a spring like uh, uh, energy. V is some corrector, some displacement inside the cell, and eta here is nothing else than uh, here it is the gradient of, uh, of U. So the U is a, is a macroscopic variable, so eta U is more or less the gradient of U, the strain. And key uh, UV is more complicated, it contains the second gradient of U, which we are happy to see here, and it contains also the gradient of V, where V is an internal variable, which is constrained by this equation to be linked with the gradient of U. So now I will explain... Is it possible to zoom the projection? Pardon? Is it possible to zoom the projection? To zoom? <laughs> So now I, I want to explain how to compute this, uh, how to, to use this formula. So it's a, uh, it's a, it's a rather simple uh, object because here you deal with functions which are defined at the nodes of the cell and in the cell there is a few number of nodes, three, six, nothing, nothing more. So you have a, a function here which is a quadratic function, so it is a linear algebra problem with a very uh, lit, uh, small uh, dimension. You are working in dimension, let's say you have something like 12 equations with 12 uh, unknowns to be solved in a linear system. So it's not so, so difficult to do. So what is easy to do is first to, to say that you, you deal with the constraint here. It gives V as a linear function of gradient U, of eta U plus some function in the kernel of this energy. This energy may have a kernel. It has always a, a non-vanishing kernel. Uh, for instance, um, uniform translation are in the kernel of this energy. So you get V up to an element which I called V tilde here. Then you minimize with respect to W and theta, which is very easy linear algebra, and you end up with an energy which has this form, with a term depending on the second gradient of the displacement and the gradient of V tilde, 
plus a term due to bending which contains a strain and V tilde. And then last year I wrote this sentence in the best case, cases the variable V tilde can be eliminated. And then I want to show you that the other case are at least as interesting as the case when V tilde can be eliminated. And another point is that this result remains valid whatever the dimension of the cell and of the limit model are. We can, uh, you will see on the examples. So let us start with the simplest example as possible. A beam made by a cell, made by two nodes, and you have bars like that, one diagonal here. So you know this example, it's an example for students. And what gives this energy, the, the, our homogenization result, it gives an inextensible euler bernoulli model. The constraint remains, a part of the constraint remains, so the, the, the beam is inextensible, and then you pay for the bending of the beam. So, <coughs> a, cla a quite classical result. So, I have just to say that this uh, constraint means that you are acting on this beam with forces which are not able to make a finite extension of it, but able of bending it. Okay, so all the constraints in the other example has to be understand in, uh, understood in this sense that you are acting with forces which are not able to extend. If you are acting much, uh, ha much harder on it, then you will get some uh, extension, but here you will have uh, degeneracy with respect to bending, because your force is too, too high. Now, take the same beam and cancel the diagonal. What do you obtain? You obtain this model. V tilde cannot be eliminated, some part of it remains, which I call phi, and then you get this model, automatically. And what is that? This is an inextensible Timoshenko beam. So the, the value of phi up, uh, uh, appears automatically from the procedure, the homogenization procedure. It is what remains of tilde V, which is the kernel of the constraint. So, now, the pantographic beam. So now you have six nodes here, two, four, uh, wait, and two here inside, so six nodes. And if you homogenize this, you get this model, which is a second gradient model. And you can understand the way the, ex the extension of the cell, uh, the, the information of the extension of the cell pass to the next cell, because when you are extending this cell, then these two nodes shrink, and because of the shrinking of these two nodes, then this cell here knows that it has to extend to. So the way the extension of this cell pass to the next cell is due to the internal mechanism which is here, which is the pantographic mechanism. So it works also when the cell is a 3D cell, but one, one dimension of periodicity. So if you try to, uh, to, to put this in the, in the model, then you get an inextensible 3D Euler model, Euler Bernoulli model. So sorry for the quality of, of the drawing, but my computer died two, two days ago, so I had to deal with a, a copy of a image from a PDF file, so I'm sorry about, about that. So if you try with a triangle uh, mesh like that, what do you get? You get a complete rigid uh, model. So, why? Because you are acting with forces which are not able to extend the bars, not enough, so you cannot extend any bar, so your, your membrane is rigid. But now, what happens if you deal with a square grid? Then you are again not able to extend the bar, so you have no extension in the two directions, horizontal and vertical direction, but you can have a shear, and you will pay for the shear. Okay, so this has no Coursera vector. Uh, uh, it was true for the 1D beam, but not for the 2D grid. And you get a classical model, but inextensible in two directions. The direction of the fibers. 
Now, you, maybe you don't like the constraint, you can uh, erase the constraint, you replace all the bars here, the vertical bars and horizontal bars by some zigzag, and then you get something which now is a complete uh, classical elastic material. And now, what about honeycomb membrane? It is known for special properties, so I checked if it was a second gradient material, but no. You find a constraint, which is a volume constraint, and then you pay for the remaining part, the free part of the, of the deformation. So it is a classical elastic material, but with a constraint of incompressibility. Okay, it is a membrane, a 2D, a 2D model. Now, uh, you take the square grid and you add a, a diagonal, but on one row over two. What do you obtain? You obtain something which can have this type of shear in which each bar here remains undeformed, but here you have some bending of, the, of these beams. So in doing this, so you have again no extension in horizontal and vertical directions, but you pay not only for the shear, but also for the bending of the bars. Here you have a bending term, so you have a second gradient material, but it is not a complete second gradient material, it is a couple stress material. <coughs> now, the pantographic membrane. So you, we are uh, plugging different uh, pantographs uh, ab above, and uh, when we pass to the limit, we get a complete second gradient material, which is a bit complicated because it is not, uh, you have no symmetry here, and so you have some coupling. Now, if you consider uh, um, something like that, in which here I have authorized uh, crossing interaction. So here, this node is in interaction with this one, and this one with this one, but the bars are not uh, interacting. So you get, again, inextensibility, but now you get a Coursera membrane, because here you have an extra variable coming from tilde V, which is related to the global rotation, coupled with the global rotation, and you pay for the difference. You can mix second gradient effect and Coursera effect. You can pass to plates. So this is a Kirchhoff-Love plate, classical one. This is a minlin heisner plate, where you have some vectors, directors. You can uh, make some generalized minlin heisner plates with two directors, phi and psi, and you can have as many as you want. You can uh, check what an origami plate gives. It gives uh, an energy like this one, which is, uh, uh, you have a bending terms and um, uh, terms uh, uh, related to the, to the, so you have a constraint which is very interesting here be between uh, uh, um, the two uh, horizontal uh, directions and uh, it becomes more complicated and uh, uh, in plane second gradient also if the faces are reinforced by a node out of the plane, out of the face. Now you can go to 3D materials if you want, so the cubic lattice gives a classical uh, uh, elastic material, but then you can mix the pantographic structure in the three direction of the space, and in that case you get an energy which has all the second gradient, not all, many second gradient terms, all the complete second gradient terms, gradient of extension terms, and bending terms, plus a first gradient energy. So, what about coupling? Because in all these uh, examples, I have no coupling between first gradient and second gradient terms. And the result gives no coupling between, because the two terms come from different uh, physical uh, effect, extension and bending. So if we want to get some coupling, it is possible, we have to move the point here a little bit on the right, these two points here, this one and this one here. If you do that, we break the symmetry and we get an inextensible beam. So we have to be more cautious and say that, okay, we will move this node, but only for a displacement of order epsilon square, which is very small, the order of the stickness of the bars. 
So you move this point just a little bit and then you get a coupling like that. So this has a huge imp implication. It means that when you are designing your metamaterial by, by this, if you made an error here of order epsilon square, meaning this thickness here, or half of the thickness, then you change your model by uh, inducing a macroscopic coupling. So it is very sensitive to design. So this is my conclusion. Uh, uh, in these structures, you get generalized continua as easily as you get strained gradient materials. They come together. So you cannot say that one is uh, more legitimate than another term, that second gradient terms are limit of uh, generalized continua, or reciprocally that generalized continua are only regularized model of strained gradient. They come together at this, at this order. Uh, I think that it is a good pedagogic tool to understand how these uh, this effects come by homogenization. And the last, uh, the last remark is that they are extremely sensitive to design. Okay, thank you for your attention. Ah, so I know how to produce third gradient, uh, but it's more complicated and the assumption, the starting assumption has to be changed and the order of, um, so here I have made the assumption that this is order epsilon square while this is of order epsilon. This is the, the, critical, uh, the critical assumption for getting strain gradient. If you want to get so, uh, third gradient of displacement, then you have to make a different assumption for this uh, thickness and also to have a much intricate design because it is not only due to this uh, geometrical assumption, then you have to make a design. You, you have seen here that depending on the design you find the strain gradient or not. So if you want to get third gradient, you have to make a very intricate design.